my, uh, my discussion this morning, this afternoon, is, you know, what do we do with the ISQ numbers? You know, what do they mean? How do they help us? You know, how do we use them? And actually, I, I reduced the talk down to, four, to looking at the outcomes on 400 implants. Uh, I'm basically a clinician. I, this is uh, work from my private practice and uh, doesn't reflect anything that I've done at the university. Um, I got introduced to this uh, uh, technique uh, several years ago. And so I just want to go back and review a few things. Uh, uh, for all of you in the audience, it's very imposing to, to follow Danny Boozer. Uh, but what do we know about implants? Well, primary implant stability is generally accepted as the major factor in obtaining osseointegration. And for many years, the Brandenburg Protocol favored exact healing periods to avoid the premature loading. And we know these have been very strict and very regimented, and that we know that micromotion has been linked to fibrous tissue formation and obviously uh, loss of the implant. Uh, more recently, uh, early loading or the immediate implant loading is considered uh, in restorations and has really become very popular. And research suggests that there's a range of motion that's acceptable, but uh, it does not interfere with uh, inter uh, the osseointegration. So we do know, all of us in this room know, that excessive motion will lead to fibrous tissue formation and obviously a failure of the implant. So the question is, how do you measure uh, stability? And, and some of this has been alluded to previously, but we, we know uh, that there is certainly ability to look at a radiograph and, and, and assume what we see around the radiograph to be uh, helpful in, in primary stability. The second thing, and the thing that I remember the most, is, a, is the Brandenburg Ting test, where you take an a instrument and tap the implant and get a certain resonant sound. Then came along the Perio test instrument, which many of you have used. There's been discussions about insertion torque, and there's been discussions uh, also about reverse torque at the time of uh, stage two. Uh, and then more recently, and why we're here tonight, is the discussion with the Ostel implant stability quotient readings that would help us. So why, when do we measure stability? Well, we can measure stability at the initial placement. We can measure stability at stage two. We can measure stability at early loading protocols such as temporary placement, which may be somewhere in that intermediate range. We can measure implant stability uh, at times when there's questions of failure or perhaps we consider loss of osseointegration. And we can use ISQ uh, readings as a management or communication tool. I'm uh, obviously in private practice and one of the things I do is I send back a letter every time I treat a patient. And in that letter now I include a listing of the ISQ readings for that particular patient. And I've educated my practice, uh, the, the people that refer to my practice, as to what these mean and what they can sort of expect from the numbers. Obviously, there is not a consensus, and there probably won't be after this evening, but uh, there's a certain level where we're very comfortable with what the uh, numbers are. You know, early loading call, uh, protocols have become very popular, so how do we decide when to place a temporary crown or follow some type of early loading protocol? Uh, what are the time frames relative to stability issues? How long do we wait? We've just seen, as, as was described, an elegant presentation on this. Uh, and how do you determine primary stability or what primary stability really is? And, and finally, you know, what is primary stability? So, uh, and the second thing I want to point out is why do we measure implant stability? Well, it allows us to uh, make good decisions regarding loading protocols. It also uh, individualizes patient protocols. Not everybody, not every patient, not every situation is the same. It identifies times when loading is incorrect, which is something that is also a practice builder and also saves a great deal economically. Uh, and you support the patient and the referral source with the reassurance that everything is going well. And it gives you excellent case documentation in your own practices as to what uh, and how things are happening. We developed, or I developed, a sort of a, uh, my own decision tree or uh, protocol, as you see here, uh, and we're not going to go through the whole thing, except to say that, you know, we have to determine primary stability, and you can sort of see how we do that. And then the question is, if it is primarily stable, do we, do we load it uh, within a 48-hour period, or do we wait six days or less than six days, as some suggest, as the healing curve and the bone changes, or do we go greater than six weeks, or do we go out to the standard four to six months? So this is all something that sort of is necessary for us to really be able to determine. 
And we would like to see either the stability to be maintained or the stability to inc increase. But what we don't want to see is the red line, which suggests that we have an adverse risk behavior where we're going to actually lose the implant. So if we look at this, uh, uh, some of you in this room may be familiar, but, but this is just a, a video showing uh, you know, the placement of the ISQ. Uh, uh, smart peg, and you can see the peg in an extraction, an immediate extraction site. And then it's measured, I happen to measure it in all four quadrants, so mesial distally and buccolingually. So we, we do four quadrant measurements as we see there. And as opposed to using something like a torque driver, as you see on the right hand side screen, where we have uh, an instrument being placed, uh, placing the implant by ins using a hand instrument to place the implant into the surgical site, as you can see here. And this is simply a torque driver. As we pull away, it has a torque meter on the end of it, and we can adjust the torque meter to 35, 45, 55, 65 Newton centimeters, and thereby know what the insertion torque is. And, and if you want to get real clever, you can compare the two, the Ostel readings with the, uh, with the uh, uh, insertion torques. And, and they're obviously hand pieces that will measure this and graph things for you. And that, that's obvious if you walk around the clinic here, uh, the ex exhibits. So let's just look at a couple of cases. And this is just an immediate implant with relatively early loading. And you can see the extraction uh, has taken place. And you can get a good idea of the uh, clinical uh, uh, alveolus when we look at it from several different standpoints. And we can see that we have good buccal bone. And we probably have a good indication for placement of a single implant. And this is just part of the workup preoperatively with the use of uh, CT scanning and all the adjuncts we have today, we can be pretty accurate. And we know from the literature, as we've seen uh, earlier, what Danny showed that, you know, a key parameter for implant success is stability and the maintenance of stability. So we can take in this particular patient, place the implant, and we can do four ISQ readings, as you see here. In this case, it's 71, 71, which is mesial distal, 68, 68, which is buccal lingually. And they do change. That's been my experience. We, we index this patient, uh, and we come back at 48 hours. We put a crown on. Most of the crowns I use in my practice are, in fact, not cement on, but screw retained. So we have to use a laboratory. And we look at 48 hours, and it's 71, 71, 67, 67. So maybe some of that is just uh, a reading uh, discrepancy. And then we look and place the final crown, in this case, at six months. And we can see the readings have gone 76, 76, but 70, 70 buckle and palatally. But we have a very happy patient who throughout the entire process had a implant uh, restored. Another case, which is a little bit more complicated, is that the failed implant, which you recover, leaving you a defect. And the defect, in this case, is restored with the use of BMP proteins and a protein sponge, and we get good healing at one month, but we come back then uh, at, uh, excuse me, at one month, and then we come uh, back, and at six months, we can place the implant, as we see here, so we wait the full six months. We see the ISQ readings of 72, 72, 68, 68, and then this patient goes on, and at eight weeks has temporaries placed, and at, at the eight weeks, the temporary, at their place, the uh, ISQ readings are down to 70, 70, 69, and 70. And then we go on and through the process of stage two, uh, and they wear the temporary through that process, uh, and they have a final result that looks like this, and the patient's been in temporaries a good part, uh, part of the time uh, to the restorative time. Now, we looked at 21 narrow platform implants. These are 325 by 15, and they're certain osteotite surfaces. And we, I, I, what I did is I averaged the readings at the beginning, and I averaged the readings at the end, six-month uh, interval. And the uh, average at, at the beginning was 64.93, and the average at the end was 65.3, and this is on the an all an anterior between teeth number 6 and 11. So I guess you could call that class 2 or maybe class 3 bone. But certainly not the readings that we, we saw earlier. Now, that may have something to do with the implant design. It may have something to do with the implant surface, uh, but it certainly doesn't show the numbers we saw earlier today. But still, this patient had a very successful outcome, and uh, many of the patients that were like her also had successful outcomes with the, the temporary. Now, if you go to the posterior maxilla, and instead of talking about a sinus graft, looking at a socket graft using uh, an alveolo, uh, uh, allograft plus a mixture of, say, in this case, uh, a BMP, using one of the collagen constructs, 
and grafting this, like you see here, you get a nice, a nice result for socket preservation utilizing the mineralized allograft plus BMP2 sponges, which is very, very popular now in the United States. And you can look at the healing at four weeks and look at the uh, radiographic consolidation at four weeks and then look at three months and you can see the radiographic consolidation. We've been able to maintain the buccal plate intact and then we place an implant. This particular implant happens to be a BioHorizons implant, uh, which has a much different uh, surface characteristic and also a different con uh, uh, design. And you can see at placement we have in this graft, which is almost 100% grafted uh, bone with BMP and allograft, we have a reading of 76, which is very, very helpful to know that we've got a stable implant. Uh, the readings all the way around are 76, 76, 75, and 74. And then we watch this patient go through the healing process, and you can see that we more or less precluded the need for a sinus graft with a 10.5 implant in the socket site. And then we come back at stage two, and we waited a full six months here, and we can see the numbers are 75, 75, 77, and 82. And, and so we've seen an improvement like we would want to see uh, compared to the, the previous placement. But you see there's a little bit of variability, at least in my hands, on these readings. And we're pretty careful about, about how we do this, and then the patient goes on and is restored very nicely. When we look at some of the uh, other cases that we've done, anterior maxilla, and we look at the trending, I think there's something that many of you, if you start using the instrument, will notice, and that is, is that we can determine what the weakest link, I think, in the implant is. And that is, if you look at this slide, buccal lingually is a lot weaker than mesial distally. And traditionally, in the anterior maxilla, what I see is this come up over and over and over again, where we know that the weakest link in the implant is an anterior posterior movement or a protrusive movement. We can see then at uh, stage two, uh, which is at this time six months later, we see there's quite an improvement in these two readings. And this is again just uh, helpful in having the patient go through the process of healing and also with the aspect of a temporary crown. And so this just shows an immediate implant. Uh, we've, we've, we've all seen this, we all do this. I'm a much more, more conservative about loading than, than some people are. If we look at another case, however, and this is tooth number 13, uh, and we can see here that at the placement, we had very good readings, 71, 71, 68, and 69. But clearly at stage two, which is six months later, 46, 48, 46, 48. Now, if you tapped on the implant, if you twisted that implant, it still, still felt solid. But clearly this implant's failing. And it took very little to remove this implant and back it out. And so we saved this patient from going back to the restorative dentist and actually having uh, a disaster with a failed crown on a failing implant. So I think it can help very much, and you can see the, the numbers were very good. It's also very helpful in my practice when we do larger grafted cases. It's getting to be very popular, again, to use titanium mesh for reconstruction, and that's what we've seen here along with BMP. And you then have almost an entirely reconstructed anterior maxilla with BMP-generated uh, bone. And the question comes up when you place the implants or when you go to stage two, you know, what's the stability of those implants, even though they feel good? And in grafted bone, the stability of these implants was uh, 71. So I felt very good about sending this patient back then to have them restored in an area that was completely grafted bone. And if you look at the posterior ridge grafting, which is another area which has, you know, some question in terms of if you're going to build a max, the posterior ridge up significantly, uh, and you want to evaluate the bone, we look at this using, a, again, a three-dimensional collagen construct. Uh, we can see that here we've used the collagen construct with resorbable screws and with BMP, and we have uh, done a ridge rebuild on this. And we can look at, at the end of the six months and see the amount of bone that we've uh, generated with this approach and more or less double the size of that ridge. But the question is, then you place implants into it, what kind of stability you're going to have? And of course, you don't want failure. So we go back and we expose this then at approximately six months, place two implants in the site into the area. And when we measure this, we have great stability of the implant, 86, which is a very, very high number. Uh, I've had a few patients that are over 90, but very few. So we know these implants are very stable and are going to go on to be very good for, from a restorative standpoint. So it helps in that regard in my practice. And then also when we look at the maxillary sinus, which has already been addressed, there's <clears throat> excuse me, always some concern on a reconstructed sinus, which is this is with BMP, 
uh, where we had less than a millimeter of original bone, and we come back at six months after the BMP has uh, fully generated the bone, and we have an, os uh, an OSTEL reading of 81. That suggests to me that we're going to have a very successful implant. We're not going to send it back for a failure, and you can see here the areas restored. So the other area that I find helpful for me is trying to understand about the failing implant. And it's often difficult to determine implant failure. Mo most of the time in, in, in our area of the world, the patient comes back and talks about discomfort. And it will, you need to have some way to do some type of non-invasive testing, I think. And the stability uh, many, many times is there, but yet there's sensitivity. And the idea is to understand why the sensitivity is there. So outcome testing really is a vital part of understanding the evaluation of that implant. So if we look at this particular cemented restoration where we were able to get the uh, crown off the implant, evaluate it, I happened to have had the ISQ readings at placement and they were at 72, or excuse me, at uncovering, they were at 72. And now you're looking at a year later, patient comes back, we reevaluate that implant, the reading is 39, it took very little to unscrew that implant from the bone and you can see the reason why. You basically extracted an implant with the extrusion of cement. So it can be very helpful in trying to determine a failing implant. So let's just look, in, in, in closing here, at a review of implants placed and evaluated, evaluated with the OSTEL. And the question that comes up, does implant design really make a difference in the OSTEL readings? The second is, do you think that the diameter of the implant influences the OSTEL readings? Does the length influence the OSTEL readings? And does the quality of bone influence OSTEL readings? So those are questions that I asked and I will tell you right now, I don't have these scientifically answered uh, with any statistical data, but you can look at the slides with me and sort of determine and make your own mind up. We compared 200 BioHorizons implants with 200 BioMet 3i implants. This is the ISQ readings on the BioHorizons Bio implant. The, the size of the implant is on the left-hand side of the uh, slide, and then ISQ readings averaged are at, at stage one, are down through the center there. And what I did is I took the four numbers, buccal, lingual, mesial, uh, distal, or, or palatal, and averaged them. So you had some numbers, you might have again 70, you might have 68, and then you might have 65, 65. So I averaged them. Then I, I had characterized each one of these implants in terms of the, si the type of bone. <laughs> And I characterize the type of bone. And my next slide will just be the traditional bone characterization. And then I looked at the slide uh, the, uh, at stage two. And at stage two, either represented four months or six months, uh, it did not represent anything at early loading protocols. And we looked at all of these. And you can look at the size of the implant, 5.8 down to 3.8. And you can look at the length, uh, 10.5, 12, or 9 down to, or up to 15 millimeters. And you can see that there is a definite uh, change to the positive in, in these uh, particular uh, readings. So it goes uh, uh, it, most of the time like from 73 to 78. But you'll also see that you'll see an occasional average where it goes from 77 to 79, but you'll see it go from 82 to 76 in, in just a couple of the implants. So uh, even though there's a trending in the negative direction, the numbers are still well above acceptable range. Now sort of keep this slide in mind and then look at the next uh, implant, which is uh, the uh, 3i Biomed implant. And this is just characterizing the quality of classification of, of bone. All of you in this room are familiar with it. It's been popularized in the literature over and over again. So we look at the ISQ readings on the Biomed 3i. And if you just remember the previous slide very carefully, and time doesn't allow me to sort of expand this, you'll notice that the numbers on the left-hand side at stage one are lower than they were previously at stage one. You, the quality of bone levels are about the same in terms of distribution, but then at stage two, you'll see that the numbers are relatively lower than we saw previously. Now, there's a definite difference between the osteotite certain 3i implant and the biohorizons in terms of design, in terms of surface, in terms of the buttress threads. And so I believe that these numbers help support the idea that there is a definite influence in, that implant design and size has. And if you look at the ISQ readings um, on some of the smaller implants, you'll see as we saw earlier, that even at stage two, at six months, that the readings are still relatively low. And I think that's based in part on the surface and ba based in part on the design 
uh, of the implant and less uh, influenced by the type of bone it's in. So in closing, what are some takeaway thoughts that we can have with this device? I've integrated it into my practice so it's a completely, totally important part of the practice. I, I, every patient gets Ostel readings in all four quadrants. And we can see that it's an excellent and it's non-invasive device for measurement of implant stability. And I emphasize non-invasive because a lot of my colleagues in Portland, Oregon use the reverse torque technique where they literally try to unscrew the implant before they send the patient back to the restorative dentist. It, it, it allows you to be certain that the smart, uh, the smart peg is important for good readings to make sure that smart peg is securely s placed into the implant. You'll get false negative readings if that is not totally engaged in the implant. Record all four quadrants, I think, to get a correct understanding of what's really going on with that implant, buccolingual versus mesial distal. You may be able to tell, at least subjectively, where the weak point on the implant is. For instance, these, these anterior maxillary implants that you're early loading, you certainly don't want these implants in a protrusive load because of the fact that you'll see, if you start doing a lot of this, that the weak point is buccal and often palatal. So it may suggest where the weak point is. It's an excellent way to communicate with your colleagues, uh, your restorative colleagues. Uh, or if you're a restorative colleague, it's an excellent way for you to uh, discuss things with your surgeon. Uh, and I think it, you, it helps me improve my results. It makes me understand where I can do things more aggressively versus less aggressively. And finally, I think it eliminates sending a failed implant back to a clinician and going through the process of then having to redo the entire process, which like Danny said, is a matter in my practice, we redo everything at no charge. So the less we can do of that, the better off we're gonna be. So I wanna thank you and I wanna thank uh, Lars and uh, Austell for this kind invitation to come to uh, Scotland. I, I hope that you've gotten an opportunity to see just how I do this in, in a private clinical practice setting. Thank you very much.